I want to introduce the man that has made it a lot easier for me to realize what this man has done and uh, what role he's played in American history. And that's the gentleman who put the a documentary film together called Civil Rights and Wrongs. Eric Fournier, it's a pleasure to say hello to you. Hello. Thank you for having us. I asked you earlier, and I'll ask you again for this particular broadcast, Eric. Uh, where, when did you get the gem of the idea, or who influenced you to pursue this case? Well, um, I'm very, very close friends with uh, Fred and Catherine Korematsu's son, Ken Korematsu. And um, it was actually Catherine's idea for the movie. She called up Ken one day and said, why don't you make a movie about your father? So, long story short, I ended up coming on board, and uh, the rest is history. What about, well, I did again, uh, then for this particular uh, moment, the time period involved, well, your first your first obligation, your first challenge when you accepted this idea? Um, I guess it was, it's been seven years now since I first got the call. And, uh, well, I'd been hinting around to Ken that I, for a year prior to that that I was willing to do it. So uh, it, it's been eight years now. But the, the original germ of the idea started in 1990. So uh, the film was finished in 2000. So we're talking about a 10-year uh, start-to-finish program. But I was aware, Eric, that you had never before done a documentary uh, on, on, a, on a political issue like this. Well, I, I, I had done doc, social documentaries before, but I'd never done an historical documentary that had the sort of research um, needed that this one had. Um, most of my films were sort of visceral. I followed a current day figure around and just showed what was happening. This was a lot more involved. Let me ask this question. How did it impact you personally? What did you come away with? Well, I came away with two great friends and Fred and Catherine, sort of like surrogate parents now. but. Um, it's just a real appreciation for, um, well, there, there were no, let me put it this way, there were a number of ironies in the case. There was an irony of Fred, who was actually shunned by his own community at the time that he made his courageous stand, um, later to become a hero in that community. Um, there is the irony of one of the most liberal courts that America ever, ever has seen, um, creating what is probably considered one of the most egregious um, judgments that they've ever come down with. Um, some of the members of that court that voted with the ruling opinion uh, went on to be titans of American civil liberties. Um, so those things sort of interested me. Um, to learn about them, learn about the underworkings of all of that, and then also see the growth in America. Um, to see how America was then and how America is now. I mean, a lot of people watch the film and seem to think that it's an indictment of America, and I don't believe it is. I believe. It shows that America is a, a work in progress and that it's incumbent upon all of us to keep that working towards progress rather than regressing. Were you aware of, uh, of Robert Jackson uh, only maybe through the Nuremberg trial? Um, yeah, if I had a knowledge of Robert Jackson but prior to this, it was very super superficial. Um, you know, I knew he was a justice during um, the war period. Uh, I knew that he had left for Nuremberg, and that was pretty much it, um, until I started re reading his opinions in the Korematsu case and then trying to find out more about him. And certainly just in the last two days being here at Chautauqua and Jamestown, I've, I've learned quite a bit more. Um, very lucky to have met uh, an extraordinary scholar who's doing a biography on, um, <coughs> excuse me, on, um, on him. So uh, it's been a good couple of days. I, I was aware through my morning visit that uh, PBS has the rights to your documentary. Yeah, for the next 18 months, um, PBS has my, do my documentary under contract. So um, it's really up to them when to air it. We uh, were lucky enough to just win two Emmys, so possibly that might put a, a, a little bug in their bonnet or be in their bonnet and make them show it again soon. So we'll see. Has any school system, has any public school, any university, any college taken advantage of, of, of listening to this film and watching this film? Well, Fred, Catherine, and I actually tour quite extensively, a little bit less now, with the film. We've been to many colleges. Um, we have an educational distributor. I know Korematsu versus the United States is taught in every second-year constitutional law class in America. So there is great interest in the film.
for that reason. So it is it's shown quite a bit. And just this year, we found out that um, in Fred's hometown, they're going to be naming a school um, from the district that he went to school in after him. And as part of that, the Oakland School District has um, and made part of their permanent curriculum, Korematsu versus the United States. So is there, a, is there an addition to the film in the future, uh, Eric? Uh, is there a sequel of any kind? I could make this my life's work. It is mm. such a compelling story. There's so much here. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> there are other things that interest me as well. But I, I'm dedicated to the cause, and I'm dedicated to the family. So. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to do more. I'd love to do something on Justice Jackson, for that matter. But you know, we'll, we'll see what the future brings. Well, Eric, you're sitting next to the historic figure and his lovely wife. We thank you for that background, and it makes it uh, certainly easier to uh, to meet Mr. Fred Karamatsu. Kor Kar Kor Karamatsu. Karamatsu. Let's see what's. K o r e m a t s. Say that again. Koromatsu. K-O-R-E. It, it's really Kore, but Koromatsu. Yeah. I apologize for the mispronunciation. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> you're not the first no, one. You're not it? the first one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to say I won't be the last. No. <laughs> Let me say this, Fred. Can I call you Fred? Yes, yes, you can. You know, I have to tell you this. Watching that film... Uh, I said to others, uh, you know, to see you uh, p make your appearance after that film was one of the most momentous moments in my life. Uh, thank you. I want to thank you for that. Because uh, I, uh, uh, I want those uh, who, who I speak to to be interested in what I have to say uh, regarding to the Constitution. Well, I have to put it this way, Fred. You represent to me the average person. You represent a hardworking person. You represent a person with simple tastes. But you also represent the fact that you will stand up for what you think is right. And you pursued this matter for 40 years. You could have easily said the decision was made and you could have walked away. Why? Well, because uh, it's not for me, it's for all America. And this could happen to any American citizen. And I didn't want to have that. And so therefore, we have the Constitution and we got to stand by it. That's all we have in America. So I'm going to give Nancy an opportunity here to ask yeah. a question. Actually, I wanted to ask Eric first, um, what category of Emmy did you win? Um, the first uh, Emmy was for Outstanding Achievement in uh, Editing that I shared with my co-editor, uh, Jean Kawahara, and the second was for Best Direction of Documentary. And Mr. Kuramatsu, I was very interested in your age at the time. I mean, 23, I, I just can't imagine um, having such uh, convictions formulated at that age. I, I mean, it was remarkable. I, does that occur to you, of how mature you must have been to um, want to, to not be acting like a, a young college student uh, and, and doing other things? I no, because at that time, we were classified as the enemy, and I didn't like that. And, and you know, I was born here in America. This is my own country. And uh, uh, even uh, I, um, for others too, that uh, uh, this was happening it was wrong. So uh, I was determined if I had the opportunity that I was going to, uh, to fight it. Fred is certainly not what I would consider a Japanese uh, Christian name. Is that th is there a history to your first name? Oh, oh Fred? Oh, that, 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 no, that was just given to me by my teacher. My, actually, my first name is Toyo Saburo. That sounds a lot yeah. better. <laughs> and, okay. so, so I said, I think I'm going to name you Fred. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it was after that. First but, grade. So I got my 
first of all, I'll say Mr. Korematsu again here uh, to be uh, respectful uh, and for this opportunity. Uh, when you f did Robert Jackson's dissenting opinion, did you read that dissenting opinion? Yes, yes, I am. From that opinion, did that, in a sense, strengthen your resolve, your 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 idea to pursue the case? Well, um, it was um, during the case. I mean, I, I I didn't know anything about. I mean, about I knew about Jackson, but I didn't go any further than that. That he was one of them because Murphy was another. And uh, and there was another two uh, Roberts. So I knew that they they were on my side. Did did you get any discouraging remarks along the way, saying, "Fred, your 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 task is impossible"? Well, I had um, uh, the, well the president of a company I was working for tell me that friend this happened a long time ago and he says it's not going to happen again he says why don't you forget about it you know so I I think a lot of people before I arrived here knew I was going to have this opportunity they wanted to ask what time did you spend in internment well I how many how long yeah I spent about a, about a year and a half because sure. I at that time, they um, they were letting uh, those in camp go if uh, they had a uh, skill like welding and so forth. And I had a skill welding, so there was three of us, and uh, and we had a company in Salt Lake City that wanted us, so therefore I, I got to go. So I took that opportunity to go to Salt Lake City and work. Mr. Karamatsu, I understand that this is quite a privilege for us here in Jamestown today that you don't ordinarily uh, grant interviews as you have uh, been probably uh, given many chances to continue giving nonstop interviews. So thank you very much for talking to us today. I'm interested in whether you have been to Japan yourself. Yes, about two years ago, uh, my son-in-law, he's in the uh, carpet, uh, he's a carpet representative for international carpets all over the world. So he had a, 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 a business in, in, done in uh, carpet done in uh, Japan. Is your name recognized there? Are you a celebrity in, in Japan or would you be uh, probably unrecognizable to most? Well, um, uh, I they have a uh, uh, representative from Japan come down to talk to me, and even some of the, the news people, and, and I also had a professor from, I think it was Tokyo, U Tokyo University, come down and speak to me. But uh, the time that I went, two years ago, I, I didn't want anyone to know about it. I mean, I didn't want any, you know, some of them bother me for inter interviewing me about what I was doing and so forth because I just want to en enjoy the countryside and the people there. Yesterday your wife was asked um, what her family thought of her marrying an, an Asian. What did your family think of you marrying a, a non-Asian? Well, I had that long It's <laughs> 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 sort of a personal thing but you know, I mean, I did go around with an Asian girl, and uh, I got turned down. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> I said, well, uh, well a anyway, I, uh, I did go around with um, most of my friends were, you know, were in school and so forth, and Caucasian and so forth. So, I mean, it just happened, that's it. And you ended up with your best friend being Caucasian over here. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I just, well, you know, I met her and I, I liked her and, and uh, she was going to, I met her in Detroit and uh, she was uh, uh, going to Wayne University, uh, taking up, uh, and she was going uh, 
for her master's degree in is it biology? Or what? No, medical technology. Medical technology. That's what I meant. I want to go back uh, to the internment uh, period in your life. Uh, yeah. uh, did you say when they took you to the racing stable yeah. and the stalls were your homes, yeah. was your prison in a sense, yeah. did you say that these are for horses and not for human beings? Right. <laughs> and in fact, uh, the jail, the city jail that I went to in the federal jail was much nicer than that. <laughs> because there wasn't any facilities like that uh, at the racetrack. It was just made for horses. And that's what I said. I, when you, when they were going to do this, you, did you simply say to them, wait a minute, I'm a welder, I'm working in defense of my country, I want to serve this country, but they've turned me down. And how can you do this to me? Well, um, <laughs> He wasn't really given the opportunity to uh, say that. I mean, mm. it was just a mass roundup. So he never, they didn't really come and ask him whether it was okay no. with them or not. Um, I'm sure that he probably uh, wasn't allowed to speak at the time when he was. Um, he wasn't, but uh, uh, he didn't speak at his hearing. At his first trial either. Yeah. So, um, But in the film, he, he in a sense, escapes the to Salt Lake City, am I right, Eric? Um, no, he, he hides underground in San Francisco Bay Area. Um, he never leaves the Bay Area. He's caught a couple of months later in the Bay Area. Um, he just made the decision that this was not what he wanted to do. He didn't feel that it was right. He was an American citizen. He was born and raised in the area. In fact, um, there's one of the quotes out of Justice Jackson's dissent was that, you know, how unusual it was that a man would be convicted for um, living in the place where he was born and um, staying in the place where he'd spent his entire life and that essentially that this was his crime. So. But also in the film, if I may repeat what was in there, uh, he had some uh, cosmetic surgery done. Is that yeah. right? Yes, I did. Uh, what did you that, hope to accomplish by that? Well, as, actually I had a Caucasian girl with me uh, and we were planning to maybe eventually uh, leave, but but evidently she didn't want to. She didn't tell me that. But, but then uh, when somebody looking at the paper, saw, she saw the advertisement of a cosmetics with surgery. And, and so, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's another possibility, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I guess, uh, being by myself for a long time, I uh, decided to try it, and that's what I did. Mr. Kermat, so this is a tough question, but I really felt watching the film yesterday that we were left wondering whether the woman you never saw before possibly had turned you in or had alerted the authorities of, of your whereabouts. Could you comment on that? Well, I, I can only say that's a big question. <laughs> you know, I don't know myself. It's been a real but, you know, it could be, but your guess is just as good as mine, what happened there. Let me go, that the 40-year period that existed between the time you were interned and the time the case was overturned, what were you doing all that time? Well, I was just um, uh, waiting for someone to, some attorney to volunteer to to uh, open the case for me because I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what, but I knew that, you know, hey, we, we, all, we have the Constitution, and, 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 and to have this happen, it can happen to anybody again. Oh, and I just wonder, am I an American? Well, what am I? Because you know? uh, Japan doesn't want me either. <laughs> So, uh, uh, for a question like that, I, uh, uh, um, uh, I was hoping that some attorney would, uh, uh, you know, call me and tell him, but uh, most of the time was, you know, they just want to know my experience, what I'm doing, and so forth, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, not, nothing more, 
interesting to try to, to open up my uh, case until Peter Irons, 40 years after, called me, and he was the one, you know, he saw my, so uh, uh, that, that's how I got, got going on. Well, since Catherine won't speak up for herself, he was also raising a family. He was married and yeah. had two lovely kids and <laughs> was working two jobs during that time. So he had yeah. quite a full life. Yeah. But there was uh, also the news that he kept it from his children. Professor Barrett was telling me that earlier, that yeah. your children weren't aware that you were doing this. Well, here's the thing. You know, I, I, I was actually like this American family. Uh, and I, my you know, wife and so forth, and we had two children. And uh, as they're growing up, uh, my daughter joined the Girl Scouts, and then she also took, uh, and she took up clarinet, and, 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 and she was uh, one of the lead uh, clarinet in the orchestra in school. And, uh, you know, she also had to go to uh, special classes besides school for the clarinet, and then on top of that, she took ballet, and uh, and then in the ballet lessons, you, uh, you had to go, she had to go uh, to a special class in, uh, out of the school uh, for private lessons in ballet. And uh, so that took a lot of time. <laughs> so, you know, what happened was, and then w later on in, in high school, she went for a cheerleader. And since she knows ballet, there wasn't any other student who could compete with her in cheerleading. So she became the head cheerleader. So you just can imagine, you know, she'd come in the house and go in and, and out. She'd in go. other words, she didn't have time to hear your stories. Right. <laughs> and and, and that thing, I, I had to uh, uh, have two jobs to keep up my house because I, I bought a house that, you know, at that time, uh, 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 you know, it, it was ex quite expensive and so I had a, a two jobs. So, uh, and then uh, my son was, uh, you know, we had a little league and boy <laughs> scout. And so, so, you know, uh, and, Sounds and like I a had, typical and American had, yeah, family. Typical huh? guy, and, <laughs> and, and, and on top of that, I'm thinking about my case and everything, and, and you know. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I, I, I just didn't have, I, when I, I never had time to talk to my daughter because she'd come in and she's just, I and she'll eat and <laughs> she's gone. <laughs> so that's the way it was. <laughs> you and your wife, I felt we're giving quite a testimonial to the American Civil Liberties Union and actually Catherine you to the YMCA yesterday to the elder hostel just saying how your husband and his brother had been able to stay there maybe at a time when um, they were badly yeah. in need of, of housing I'd love to hear more about your feelings about the ACLU and, and the YMCA I think you could, uh, I, she can give you more about that um, well, you know, the, it was the American Civil Liberties Union, the executive director, who read about Fred in the newspaper and uh, went to the jail to see him. Surprised Fred, you know, he just couldn't believe it that there was somebody. He had been uh, shunted around from one jail to another because they didn't know what to do with him. He ended up in federal jail. And uh, so uh, Mr. Bessig uh, wanted to know if he was being treated well and uh, if he would be, a, if he would um, uh, want to fight the case. And uh, Fred was in favor of it, but he did talk to, uh, after he was, he was in Tamparan before, uh, for a while before the final hearing. and. Uh, uh, I guess his brother said, well, uh, we want to see, who, who, uh, you know, what the other people here feel about it, the, the so-called community leaders that were there. Uh, and uh, so they had a meeting, and Fred went. And pretty soon, he said they were standing around in groups of three and, three and five people, and 
pretty soon they all just left. They just disappeared. And Fred said, and they never talked to him. And Fred said, ask his brother who had instigated all of this, his eldest brother, uh, what happened? And he said, well, they're afraid that if you do any, if Fred, no, it was whether or not he should fight the case. And they said, well, he would only make it harder for everybody if he did it. And uh, uh, so I guess they thought if, you know, ever, that, that they would be branded if Fred f fought the case, they would be branded as insurgents or something. And so they, they refused to get involved. But of course, all they could have done was um, moral support. He could have used that. And he didn't have the support of his family either. Uh, they, his father was ashamed of him uh, because that in the Japanese family you don't go against the family wishes. And uh, they were born in Japan, so they thought a lot like, you know, uh, the Japanese uh, do in Japan. So anyway, uh, Mr. Bessig rescued him and was determined to fight it all the way because Mr. Bessig said, uh, 40 years later when we talked to him as the case was going to be reopened. He had retired then. He said it was unconstitutional then that what the government did, and it's still unconstitutional. You know? Let me uh, take a moment here. We need take a, take a quick break. Yeah. Quick break. Okay. Thank you. We'll pause for a moment and we'll be right back. Most of the Japanese people of Fred's generation, which is the second generation called Nisei, did not talk about this to their children. If they did, they were, it was, some people say they did, but most of the people didn't. Uh, they felt a lot, you know, they were put in prison, so to speak. And although they knew they didn't do anything wrong, it sort of, uh, left them feeling guilty of something they weren't quite sure what and so uh, the, the same as with Fred it was something that uh, it was difficult to talk about uh, and it's only since Fred's case gained national recogni rec recognition the um, sep second case that uh, people have come out of the woodwork and now they're all talking. Well, not everybody. There's still people. I have, I have uh, some of the younger generation tell me that their grandfather, their grandmother won't say a word about it. And when they ask that she won't talk about it. So, and that kind of thing. But by and large, uh, and, and there are people who, you know, are grateful to Fred because he did, because it helped very much in the redress reparations, it wasn't the only factor, but it was the first time when they had the press conference on January 19th, 1938, the day your case was filed. And the person, the attorney doing the public uh, relations uh, was able to get all three major networks there. There were only three at the time. And um, the, that night, all of them had the story on the evening news. And uh, from that, that, because the redress reparations was rather hidden, uh, you know, newspapers weren't, weren't interested in it. And uh, so the press in general. I'm so glad you explained what the Nisei was, because I heard you mention that, but I didn't know what it meant. Yes, that's like e, e what is e ni uh, sa, uh, I've forgotten what. Yang, those are like one, two, three, four in Japan. I, I may not be saying those correctly. Um, but, um, and so the first generation is considered to be the people who were born in Japan and came here. And uh, uh, Fred's generation is considered second knee. Does your husband speak Japanese? Oh, very little. But strangely enough, when we were in Japan, of course, they a lot of people in the restaurants and hotels speak speak you know, a certain amount of English now. And uh, sometimes in the restaurants, though, he was able to make it uh, make them understand uh, a little bit more what what we were ordering, you know. So anyway, 
It was it was uh, it was fun, and we met his first. He met his first cousin for the first time. That's the only living cousin. And he showed Fred. We, he took us to his home. Uh, he took us first to the temple, Buddhist temple. Be ready here in a moment. Where his for Fred's gra gra uh, grandfather was uh, the ashes, you know, had a niche. And then we went to lunch, and then he took us to his home, and had a, there was a neighbor girl who had mar uh, married a, uh, an American, and she had learned a lot of English, so she came over and helped interpret. But he said, he brought out a video, and he said, I want to show this to you. Uh, in a, and he put it on, and it was a Fred. He knew about Fred. Fred didn't know about him. He, uh, and we're, we're so sorry because we could have corresponded all those years. But he uh, um, showed Fred the film, and it was uh, uh, from uh, Japanese television, and it was about Fred and the opening of his case in 1983. Well, uh, start, okay. Uh, Mr. Karamatsu, uh, did your parents ever come to the United States? Yes, they came to the United States. Well, I'm sorry to say that the, uh, the judge wanted me to ask the question. Sure, they were here because you were born here. Yeah, but the was, question seems a little bit irrelevant. Like <laughs> At the time, I was just thinking, you're right. Uh, the question I want to wrap it up with, because I know we've taken a lot of your time. I want to thank you for your patience and your participation. Give us an insight into the day that you were at the White House to receive the Medal of Freedom from President Bill Clinton. Well, uh, I tell you what, um, you see, we came uh, on the flight uh, of the United States. No. It was, uh, what flight was it? I don't, it was American Airlines. American Airlines. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> Don't just skip on to the White House. I, I well, hope you, you can. Well, what happened it. was that was uh, we were delayed in Chicago at the airport, and we were four hours delayed because of the storm. And so we got uh, yeah. to Washington three o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and at and at eight o'clock we had to be at the White House. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, <laughs> so we finally did make it, but. Uh, what? It what? was rush, 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 and I, I was all nervous, you know, and there was a White House, and, and you know, it's a big deal, and uh, uh, so uh, 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 everything was rushed, and, uh, and we got there, and uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't have a taxi go to the White House, they don't allow that. So my son-in-law got a limousine, so we had to have a limousine. But he arranged all that, and so uh, it was quite a quite a big, you know, thing to have. have I mean, I can't explain it because I, this has never happened to me before. Before, and my wife and I. And Where is that medal today? Uh, it's in the drawer. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, we did want to put it in a, in a suitcase that was going to be. We, yeah. I used to carry it, but you see now yeah. it's metal, and they get rid. One time before they this uh, September the 11th, it was a, I had put it in a box in the bottom of the suitcase, and oh, they ma I had to take everything out, and then I showed them. I said, "This is the Medal of Freedom that uh, the president uh, gave to him." Uh, and these people are mostly foreign-born out in San Francisco. And uh, I don't think he, he understood what it was, <laughs> but he didn't try to take it away from me. So, uh, but I know now, if I carried it uh, uh, on, in my purse or something, they would make me take it out and probably keep it. They're very strict. And because there's metal, you could hit somebody with it, you know. But. Um, Anyway, so we don't carry it anymore because I can't take it on the plane and I won't put it in a bag that has to be um, um, checked. 
because you never know if you're going to get your luggage back. <laughs> and, that's irre and that's irreplaceable. Oh, there's no doubt about tell, that. Tell them about meeting the president. Well, um, uh, you know, meeting the president was, was quite a thing. I can't explain to you because I never, uh, yeah. I, I, I didn't really, you know, how important. I mean, it was a, it, he was the president and, <laughs> and, and to meet him. And, well, uh, tell, it, tell how you met him. And, uh, well, he, at first the, um, we were all in, uh, there were uh, seven of, of us in one room. And uh, and that was seven in another room. And the um, Marine captain that uh, in, in, uh, was in charge of us announced that the president was coming. Wait. So um, we, I thought, you know, the president would just come in the, to the room and say hi to everybody, and you know. And uh, uh, you know, and just say hello and go uh, and leave, you know. But no, he came in and uh, and talked to each one of us and thanked us for coming and so forth. And, and that really kind of floored me because I didn't expect him to do that to to come to me and shake my hands and and talk to me and also to my wife and my children. So uh, that, that was quite a thrill, and uh, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll never forget it. And we'll never forget this moment yeah. that we've had with you. Thank you so much, Mr. Caramoso, and thank you so much, Mrs. Yeah, Caramoso. It's, it's oh, oh, Caramoso. Caramoso, what a wonderful story. And history being made at the Robert Jackson Center. Greg Peterson, I'd have to wrap it up with a couple of words from you. This has been and I guess you what, know, uh, the uh, uh, hectic two days. Oh, well, oh, well, oh, but a, a very exciting one. Really uh, we have an opportunity, a it's very rare opportunity, to touch the hem uh, of an individual I mean, the premier was rights in 2000, which found its way up to the uh, Supreme it didn't Court in a TV case which is studied. Uh, as it turns out, and so, the, uh, um, New York State, it, uh, part of its regents' requirements, is one Supreme Court case. Um, Fred, during the period where you are um, under arrest, you're in jail, you're being moved around, and then you're sent into the internment camps, your case is traveling up through the court system. Was, was Mr. Bessig or some other lawyer able to keep you posted on how the yeah. case was going? Mr. Bessig got we, we kept in, in touch with each other by letter. We okay. used to write letters to try to um, go write to him and, and ask him how things were going. Okay. And he would write back. Okay. Until they went to the Supreme Court in uh, 44. Right. By that, by that time, had you been released to begin the work in Salt Lake City? Yes. I was released in the... So I was working in Salt Lake City. Okay. And during that time, you weren't hearing from Bessie? Mm hmm Or you were hearing mm -hmm. from him? Oh, yeah. There's a, yeah. there's a file of letters. A file of letters back and yeah. forth. That's part yeah, of the Cormatsu yeah. Mr. Mr. Yeah. Bessie's and uh, Fred's, you yeah. know. Okay. And that's now at UCLA? Is that no, right? that one oh. isn't. That's with the California State Historical Society. Mr. Bessie gave all of his papers oh, okay. to them. Sure, it was yeah. his correspondence that, file. Yes. Yeah, and one of the uh, she uh, was she has been she's uh, resigned now, but still does a little. Uh, she was the PR person for the Northern California ACLU, which is now a big organization. Right. At that time, there was one employee, Mr. Pessig, and uh, anyway, uh, she rescued those. Uh, and uh, actually they had when for the California uh, sesquicentennial the Japanese American National Museum and um, the California Historical Society combined an exhibit and um, one or two of those letters were uh, were displayed and um, people there were other things too that had to do with internment but uh, 
that was a part of it. And at that time, they she made a copy of all the letters for us. Oh, thank goodness so we have that, that, that that was saved. In but fact, I was a, I was surprised that he checked them. You know, lawyers keep and, paper. Oh yeah, they keep everything. He checked all uh, correspondence. Right. And uh, um, of course, he passed away. At, uh, Years back, but these letters was on display in, in San Francisco. Was, uh, was That's what I just talked yeah, about. Yeah. Okay, uh, don't go, don't go over the no, thing. No, yeah. Now, I, Fred, I think you said yesterday that there was some time during which you you didn't get any news, and you had to call up or write Bessig saying, "Hey, what's going on with the Supreme Court? Or where's my decision?" Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. see, the thing is. You can block this out, but uh, the case was uh, heard in October, right. and uh, he knew that. But then he didn't hear anything, and so he—he he, that's what okay. prompted him to yeah. find out what was going on because he—he was—he wasn't knowledgeable about the Supreme Court, right. and I wasn't either until well, and, and a few years ago. That it takes three months or more sometimes right. no to, to get it, it to get to, an opinion. Right. It takes as long as they want it to take in the mm -hmm. writing of the opinions and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. going back and forth. So do you remember how you actually got the news that you had lost in the Supreme Court? Yes, uh, by a letter. Okay. Yeah. It was not by telephone. Okay. By a letter. Okay. And did Bessig send you the the actual opinion or did he just tell you the result? No, he just told me the result. Um, well, describe your reaction. You're you're a believer in the Constitution, and yeah. you've fought this all the way well, up, and then you learn you've lost. I lost, but I I I. He didn't explain to me why we lost. So that's where the puzzling part of it was for me. And so that's the part I I, I tried to get from him, but I couldn't. Right. Right. Well, he didn't and know. He why. didn't have. It. He didn't know right. So, um, all these years, and he didn't know himself right. that uh, it was the military that uh, had altered all the, the reports that was going on in the West Coast. Right. Yeah. Right. So, now that, that took so Peter so that, that was a history. thing that, that, uh, that uh, the courts uh, were, you know, Voting on it was that, was that because there was a um, ship to shore and signaling and and uh, vandalism and so forth right. was going on down there. There was out of control. Right. They, uh, it was all that, and that was all you know, false. At the time, you knew you were a loyal American, yeah. but did you think it was possible or plausible that there were Japanese Americans who were? Engaged in spying for Japan, or no, I didn't think so. Uh, the the, the, uh, um, the friends that I knew, they they would, they were just like Americans, just like I was. Right. And, and uh, uh, you can even tell by uh, uh, the records of the 442nd that you know there wasn't anyone that was. Uh, do anything like that, and, and uh, in fact, uh, they would spy on Japan for them, right? Instead, right? right. Yeah. Exactly. So, th because this is our country, right. and, and for the government to, to to do that, I you know to turn that around, well, that uh, upset me, you know, and and uh, and I uh, wondered, you know. For my children and so forth, that's coming up. Right. Are they Americans or are they, you know, Japanese? Mm -hmm. Other right. country. And so um, uh, we, we had to get that out. Right. So um, I was just hoping that someone would, you know, contact me and say, "Let's go court again." Right. And it wasn't until Peter Irons called. Right. Then. After I had Peter Irons and so on, then I, I even got uh, um, 
cooperation from Mr. Besick again, you know. Oh, he, he was still yeah, living he's, at that mm -hmm. time? Yeah, still mm -hmm. living. Okay. So he, he only, came in the picture, too. He only died about two or three years ago. Okay. And yeah. he was so in his started. 90s. Okay. He so played tennis till he was in, in his 80s. Good for him. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, so did Justice Hugo Black. Did he really? So. Yeah. Well, he, so, no, he died early, though. You, you know, was, even one of my fund, fund, fundraisers. Oh, no, he died early. Fundraising, you know, for, for my case. Right. And we needed expenses for him. Or well, even Mr. Bessick participated in it. So. To his great credit. He's, he's one of the real heroes in this. Yeah, isn't right. He? right. How, how do you feel about lawyers? <laughs> lawyers were the, the good guys, but also the bad guys in this experience you had. Well, all I meant was the good guys. <laughs> okay, the ones you knew were the good guys. Yeah, and uh, uh, of course I knew there were those that we had to get after to, to uh, fight the uh, in court, but the uh, majority of uh, all the lawyers that I, I, I met, you know, they were all uh, working for me. <laughs> right. Um, pro bono. Pro bono. Right. That's right. Yeah, pro bono. Let me jump back to the to the 40s. In, in those first few months between Pearl Harbor in December and the the first military orders in February, was there prejudice, discrimination, anti-Asian stuff? Did did it prejudice. affect you? Did you experience it in San Francisco? Oh yes. What kinds of things happened? Well, you couldn't. Uh, I couldn't even go to a certain restaurants because it turned me down. I couldn't even get a haircut, and some barbers turned me down. And, and, and uh, uh, even jobs, I couldn't get uh, certain jobs. And, and government job, no, oh, no, we don't want you. So oh, uh, I, I, I finally got a. Uh, well, I finally did get a job uh, uh, from uh, a company, a trailer mobile company that uh, made trailers and stuff like that, that uh, didn't need the, uh, if I was, uh, you know, Japanese or not. Right. Let me jump to the, to the period after internment and after the war. When you returned to California, it was the late 1940s. In, in that time period, did you have experiences of discrimination, or had it improved? Uh, and, and it's, a, it's a improved, yeah, because I, I didn't have a, a, a difficult time getting a job after that. Okay. Yeah. But. But Catherine says, but housing. Yeah, well, housing was very much discriminated. The, the housing story you told me at lunch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd like exactly. I'd like you to repeat. Tell me tell me again about you're out you're you're moving because of Bart and you're out yeah, looking for a new house. Oh yeah. yeah, well, but this uh, this was in Detroit. Oh, in Detroit. Oh, okay, yeah, let's Detroit. do that. That's another. That's another. One. Okay, well, let's do them both. Go ahead. You you tell me. <laughs> you, mean, you, you want to tell I better about tell Detroit? about Detroit because I don't know if he. Uh, anyway, we tried to find a place after we were married, and um, the only place that would rent, rent to us was a Jewish landlord, and he had an apartment building, and I don't know how we got got to him, but anyway, uh, it didn't seem to matter to him, but uh, when you, uh, you know, like, well, in those days, you rented, at a, you got the want ads, you know, and classifieds, and uh, if you call people up and, and, you know, they, and tell them, you have to tell them, you, you know, it's better to tell them up front that you're a Japanese American or that my husband was if I was calling. And, oh, no, that's, that was the end of that. We can't rent to the, him, you know. <laughs> and so, then the, the later experience in California, tell, tell me about that again. Uh, what I told you. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but now, you, now you're telling the camera. <laughs> no, I'm telling the whole world. <laughs> you're telling the whole world. 
this is that uh, um, we live right near the shopping center and down lower in the lower lane and uh, the BART system, the tra uh, tra sub the subway. Sub uh, no, it's a rapid transit. Rapid transit. Right. It's it is subway some places. We're going to come through there. Okay. And they were going to build a station there, right about a block and a half or two blocks away from we, where we live. And uh, they start to start building the station, so they were using pilings on there, they're piling them away. And Catherine starts getting upset, you know, because you know, on top of that, most some of the friends are leaving because they got paid to leave because they took the houses away because the, 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 the uh, they needed it. Uh, uh, the land mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the construction, okay. For the train. Right. So she wanted to move, so, um, and, you know, my daughter was active in, uh, in school as a cheerleader, so she didn't want to leave that school. So we wanted to get a place a little closer, you know, if we're going to move. And so it was, uh, it was up on the hill, just not too far away, about two miles away. And uh, uh, we went up on the hill, and uh, there was a 25, about 25 houses being built there were built there. Most of them were built, but there's only five left. So, um, and I knew a friend that was up there. So we went up there to take a look at those houses. And uh, um, while we were looking and, and doing that, my son uh, ran into one house, and I guess he was playing. He liked that house because it had stairs to it and everything. And we didn't know where he was, but finally we found him in that house. Well, anyway, we were about ready to go, and I saw a man work, working in his garden in front, uh, a little ways down. And so uh, I decided to be, you know, friendly by going over there and asking him how things were. And, and I went over there. <laughs> he turned around and he looked at me and says, You don't belong here. You belong down there, down below. You can't afford houses up here. You, you get one down below. That's all he said to me. And oh boy, that really upset me, you know. And uh, I went back, and uh, and I remember I talked to a real estate man about that house, and and he told me that, you know, I probably couldn't afford that, you know. I mean, it was too, ex uh, um, according to my uh, uh, wages, I wouldn't be able to make it. But I told him, I said, you get that house for me. I told him. <laughs> He said, I don't care. I'll, I'll, I'll manage somehow to get the finances for that house. And he said, well, okay. So he finally did get it. And then, of course, I had to work on two two jobs in order to keep the house. And right. So I, but I did. And I was there for 40 years. Okay. Um, I'm still, I still have the house. I still live there. And he's passed away already. <laughs> the guy down the block. The guy, the guy down the block. Did, did he ever become... Uh, I don't want to say a friend, but a neighbor? Was he neighborly to you once you lived there? No. 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 In fact, uh, uh, his house was robbed uh, uh, a few years ago because he owned about four bars and he owned a, a part of a shopping center. And uh, on a certain day, he would go to all these bars and collect the money and, and, and so, um, uh, somebody uh, uh, held him up one one uh, one night, and he had about thirty-five thousand in cash. With him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. That little story is it, it really echoes the internment story. There's there's a, a reflex you have mm -hmm. to fight injustice. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? Yeah, come from my blood, I guess. <laughs> Am I, Maybe my family. Uh, just, uh, well, my dad, I guess he I must have part of his blood because he came from Japan. Why did he come down from Japan? And I've gone there two years ago, and it was pretty nice. The country is pretty nice. But, but at the time, 
Yeah. I don't think the economy was yeah. very good. So it, and, it took some bravery to be and also, in Canada. And also, I think he was, he, he might have, this is supposition on my part, wanted to um, avoid the army, see that people were. Uh, because his uh, his cousin and the cousin's father, who was Fred's uh, father's brother, uh, they were in the military. Right. But um, anyway, he first went to Hawaii and was there two years in the sugarcane fields, and he realized he wasn't getting anywhere. So he and and uh, uh, I think two other people went, just got the boat and went to San Francisco. Fred, tell, tell me a little bit about the, the different jobs. We know you were a welder before the war, and then you were interned. Yeah. And then when you got out in Salt Lake City, you were again a welder. Yes. What did you do after that? And then I, 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 um, I worked for a good ear gas station where I did a uh, garage, good ear gas station and garage where they recap tires. And uh, they taught me how to recap tires, so I was recapping tires for about six months. Okay. Yeah. And uh, um, and I found out my brother was in Detroit, so I decided uh, I had a chance, opportunity to leave. So uh, that in the, uh, uh, Salt Lake and uh, Salt Lake City, and I went to Detroit. And, uh, well, actually, I was going to New York, too, because I had this opportunity. And um, uh, I stopped in Detroit to see my brother. And, uh, but uh, I didn't get hold of him right, right away. He was on a job. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I went to a restaurant to eat there at lunch. And, uh, the fellow sat next to me, he was real friendly, and uh, he asked me what I was doing. I, I said, well, I just, and I told him I was in town to see my brother, and I was looking for a job. Well, he said, you offer me a job. So uh, I said, well, um, first I, 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 I paused my friend, and I'll see him in New York. And so he said, oh, okay, if you, if you decide to uh, come back, look me up. He gave me his card. So I went to New York, and I didn't like New York, so I come back, and uh, I looked him up, and uh, he gave me a job. So with my, with my brother there, so. And what kind of business was that? Well, there's, it was a... Um, the companies was, was burned doors and, uh, and they made uh, great big airplane hangar doors mm -hmm. for the airports. And uh, now that the uh, war was just about over, they were converting into commercial doors for garage doors for cars and mm -hmm. residential. So uh, they want me to be in there to make drawings because they were experimenting on those doors, and that's what I was doing, making some sketches and so forth. And I would go from the engineering office to 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 the job. Well, they like my drawing so well. The engineering engineering company said, "Hey, we want you here instead." Mm -hmm. So they gave me a job as a draftsman. Okay. So, and I, and I liked it, uh, and doing that more than I did welding. So. I've been doing that ever since. Okay. Um, without formal training, you're just a self-taught Yeah, I just draftsman. taught myself into it. And that's what you continue to do in yeah, California. Right. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, your employer told you, Fred, it was a long time ago. Uh, oh, yes. And that, that was when I, uh, uh, we op opened the, my case up again in 83. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I knew the company I was working that people there was going to know about it. They've been real nice to me, so 
uh, on coffee hour, I uh, finally decided to let them know that that I was going to reopen my case and, you know, about the internment. They didn't know you were the they didn't the know. litigant from a famous Supreme Court case yeah, in the forties. No, they didn't know anything about. It. Mm -hmm. But then the o owner of the company, is the chairman of the board, called me and and says, "Fred, this happened a long time ago." And he said, why don't you leave it alone? So I don't think it will happen again. So, you know, uh, that's a kind of, um, you know, I was getting that kind of uh, neg negative report. There was no, nobody told me to say, hey, what you're doing was, you know, the right thing. Nobody? No. No, no colleague no, or friend? No, except the attorneys and even you know, the ones I was working with. Catherine. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now, once you went forward, once you did reopen the case, what happened at work? May I, inter oh, may I, I interject got, I a minute? Got laid off. May I interject a minute? There was one brother that lived uh, nearby. The other one had got, uh, that was alive and was in the Philippines, and he he died not long after. Fred talked it over with his youngest brother to tell him, you know. And he said, oh, Fred, you're not going to get any money out of this. Why don't you just leave it alone? See, his family never, never supported him. What about after, after Judge Patel ruled in his favor? After, after you won, uh, did people who had urged him not to fight it ever apologize? Not those people. Ever? His brother never said... I'm glad you did what you did, you know, and didn't listen to me. No, he never said that. Right. I mean, obviously, many of us, I mean, we're here because we're delighted that he did and that it worked mm -hmm. out in that, mm -hmm. in that long fight. Um, it's interesting that at the family level that never happened. I'll tell you who the people who really were the most complimentary and rejoiced with him were, were kids from the, we call them kids, because they're our kids, our age, kids, are, uh, our kids are the same age, um, are the Sanse, which are the third generation. Third generation. Okay. And we've had, you know, we've worked with the, some of them for the redress and all, because they, they were interested very much. I mean, they had, they weren't going to get anything out of redress, but they wanted it for their, their parents. They wanted to get this, uh, uh, straighten out, and some pe somebody said, "Well, why don't you just let the government apologize?" Uh, Fred said, "Well, you know, when you when the um, highway patrol stops you for something like speeding, he doesn't say, uh, well, just apologize. He gives you a ticket, and you have to pay. And that's the American system, you see. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, he was determined to have the government pay the ticket." Well, yeah, I mean, it was that, that you don't know how many people were helped by that. There was such a, an outpouring of relief. And, and the lot, of course, uh, the, there were, there probably were some people thought that, you know, why this, you know, why did the government do this, give them money and so forth. But the money was incidental. Right. It was just to give, as Fred has said, give some value. To the to the bill, right, right. and uh, um, right. The, the actual amount was was twenty thousand. Right. It started out the the commission recommended twenty five thousand, but then it got cut down by the right. you know Congress. There, uh, it's hard. To, it's like getting blood out of a turnip right. <laughs> to get right. any money out of them. Right, right. And it's not nothing, but it's not it's not like anybody won the lottery either. It's no it's a statement. But it was fixed so that the, 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 there were no taxes ap ap uh, applied to that. So at least, and, and a lot of people who were people of means donated their money to, uh, you know, the Japanese American National Museum, the Historical Society, Japanese right. American Historical Society, and all of that. I mean, so the, uh, uh, it it went for good causes. If, if even if people did, they had got. There were there were some people who had made millions. They were just you know circumstances that uh, they were in, and and they just were 
clever enough to see a lot of the Sansei had gone to college, whereas a lot of the Nisei had not. Some had, but a, a, a small percentage, really. Fred, have you ever heard from anyone who's a descendant of, uh, let's say, General DeWitt, 